The world is spinning out of control. Wars, famines, refugee crises, economic crises, pandemics, extremist politics, environmental collapse, global warming, AI developing faster than humans can keep up with, a world in chaos heading for annihilation. Is there any hope for the future? Here's what's coming up. We're going to take a deep dive into Revelation chapter 5, which is about the history of the world. And we're thinking about whether or not things really are out of control, whether God still has authority, and whether or not there's any hope for the future. So let's get straight into it. And welcome to the Faith in a Busy World podcast with me, Steve Griffiths. So in Revelation chapter 5, we are in heaven, transported there by the vision that God has given to the Apostle John. We're taken to heaven where we look at the events of the world from a different perspective. And it's important for us to do that. Sometimes we get so overwhelmed by the chaotic events going on in the world and the chaos of our own lives that we lose sight of God's place in all that. We need to be reminded that despite how things seem, our God is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he is sovereign over all things. Yes, we live in uncertain times. Yes, we may face severe trials in our own lives. But that's not the end of the story. Scripture reminds us that at the end of time, God God will restore all things to himself and we have waiting for us an eternity at peace in the presence of God. In difficult days, we need to hold on to that hope in the sure confidence that God will not fail us. So this heavenly scene opens in verse 1 with these words, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. So what is this scroll and why is it sealed? Well, in the Bible, it wasn't unusual for prophetic scrolls to be sealed and for the seals only to be broken when the time had come for their fulfillment. For example, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 26, we read, The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you is true. But seal up the vision, for it concerns the distant future. And again, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 9, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the end of time. So the scroll in Revelation 5 contains a prophecy outlining the future destiny of humanity and the world in which we live. And there's writing on both sides of the scroll. It's completely full, so it's a comprehensive account of world history. And the scroll is sealed. It's the final authoritative account of what's happening in the world right now and what will happen in the world in the future. So there's a lot going on in verse 1. God is sat on the throne. He holds within his hands the full comprehensive destiny of humanity, sealed in a scroll that acts as a legal document, binding in every respect. God has complete authority over his world. Now that doesn't mean that everything that happens is sent by God or God's will. Human beings are sinful and self-centered, and the chaos we see in this world, the wars, the famines, the environmental disasters, the financial crises, are a result of sinful behaviors. They do not come from God. But none of that undermines God's authority, because he still has the power to redeem our evil tendencies and bring good out of bad. And most important of all, none of the evil, sinful activities of humanity have eternal power. Christ has won the victory over sin and evil and death, and nothing can ever destroy the reality of that victory. When all is said and done, he will still be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So given that this scroll is such an incredible document, we're not surprised to read this in verses 3 and 4. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. This scroll is the destiny of humanity, the power of God over all the world. So who would have the power to open that? No one. Because the idea is not just about opening a scroll, it's more powerful than that. Since this is a legal document, the opening of the scroll indicates the enacting of what is written within it. When a solicitor opens a last will and testament, they do so with the authority to make its contents a reality. So who can open the scroll? Who can put God's plans for humanity into effect? Is there anyone in heaven or on earth or under the earth who holds that kind of authority or power? Of course not. Only God can put into effect the will of God. 
And not only is there no one powerful enough to open the scroll, there's no one worthy to even look inside it. None of us are that holy and pure. And so what we read in verse 4 is really powerful. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. So why is that so powerful? Well, because the Greek word that is used here for wept indicates a wailing, a crying out, the type of crying associated with professional mourners at funerals. And I don't think the weeping is because the scroll couldn't be opened so much as a weeping over the state of the world, that in all creation, not even one is found worthy. It's a weeping over the fallenness of God's world. But the weeping is brought to a conclusion after an elder spoke to John in verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So this verse is a real encouragement for us. Not one person in all of creation is worthy to roll out the plan of God for his creation, except for one, the Messiah who has conquered. He is able to open the scroll. The destiny of humanity and God's creation is in the hands of Jesus Christ the Messiah. That was prophesied in Psalm chapter 2 in which God says this, You are my son. I will make the nations your inheritance, the end of the earth your possession. At this stage in history, his authority is exercised in bringing salvation to the world by destroying the works of Satan and gathering his elect from all the nations. But at his second coming, every rule and authority and power will be destroyed and Jesus will be revealed as King and Lord over all. What a privilege it is to follow him as Lord and Saviour. Yes, as verse 5 tells us, the Messiah has triumphed. But how has this Messiah triumphed? How has he conquered? The answer is in verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the centre of the throne. Now here is an incredible theological truth. The lamb is, of course, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who was slaughtered. And we would expect an animal that had been slaughtered to be lying down. But no, this slaughtered lamb is standing, standing in the centre of the throne. He's been resurrected. In one incredible sentence, a deep theology of Christ is unveiled. Here we have the crucifixion and the resurrection, the slaughtered lamb standing. Here we have the power of life over death, the lamb looking as if it's been slain, but actually it lives. Here we have the centrality of Christ's death on the cross to the Christian faith, standing in the centre of the throne. And here we have proclaimed the deep mystery of God, the most incredible of truths that Christ models for us victory through sacrifice. The lamb that was slain stands again and is at the centre of the throne. And the lamb, Jesus Christ, is the centre of our faith, the object of our adoration and praise, which is why he is encircled by the four living creatures representing the heavenly realms and the 24 elders representing the church on earth. Hallelujah. But this lamb, of course, is no ordinary lamb. Verse 6, he has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world. In the Old Testament, horns were a symbol of power and royalty. In Deuteronomy 33, verse 17, for example, we read, In majesty, he was like a firstborn bull. His horns are the horns of a wild ox. So the lamb who was slain, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is royalty, the king of kings, and all-powerful because there's seven horns. And he's also omniscient, all-seeing, because he has seven eyes. And these seven eyes are the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, who is sent out into the whole world. So we've got the crucifixion and the resurrection and the Pentecostal sending out of the Holy Spirit into all the world. But is the ascension missing? No, it's mentioned in verse 7. The Lamb came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. The Lamb came. There's a movement towards God. After the Lamb had been slain and stood again, he moves back towards God the Father. And as he moves back towards the Father, he takes the scroll. And what an incredible moment this is, demonstrating the power and authority of Jesus over the whole of creation. So naturally, we read in verse 8, and when he'd taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. What other possible response could there be to the crucifixion, resurrection and ascension of the Messiah? All we can do is join with heaven and earth in praise and worship. And the nature of their worship is described in verse 8. Each one had a harp. Ah, oh, so that's where the image of angels with harps comes from. 
the praise of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. That's a lovely image. Then we come to verse 9, which opens with a really interesting phrase, and they sang a new song. Now, this is a phrase that's often used in the Psalms, and it relates to celebrating the mercy of God and his deliverance from distress and suffering. For example, Psalm 98, verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation. Isn't it beautiful to know that every time you and I receive mercy from God, heaven breaks out in a new song? That's a really comforting image, isn't it? But there's also something of a more cosmic scale going on here, because the new song that breaks out in heaven has to do with the salvation of the world and the renewal of God's creation through the death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And what is this new song that's been sung? Verse 9. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. There is hope for the future, despite all the chaos that we see in the world around us, despite all the turmoil in the world, we are assured here that God is completely in control. Christ has done all the work for us on the cross. He was slain and we have been purchased for God and restored to him. So despite what we see in the world today, there awaits for us a glorious inheritance in the future at the consummation of the new heaven and the new earth when we will reign with him. At the fullness of time, all things will be restored back to him. We can have real confidence for the future, despite what we may experience today. This is such an incredible truth, such an awesome, inconceivable reality that heaven and earth is absolutely bowled over by what has been achieved through Christ, as we read in verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. There is no number in Greek to describe the sheer quantity of angels rejoicing in heaven. They can only be described as myriad on myriad and thousands on thousands. Can you imagine such such a scene. And these countless swarms of angels surround the throne and they surround the living creatures and they surround the elders and all together they burst into one song. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Heaven is a cacophony of praise and worship. And as if that wasn't enough, Verse 13, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing. Here we have the whole of heaven and the whole of earth, every angelic being, the whole church and every part of creation joining as one voice to praise and worship God as a result of what Jesus has achieved on the cross. This is immense. This is awesome. This is beyond all comprehension. And all of heaven and all of creation joins together to say, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. And in verse 14, the four living creatures say, Amen. So be it. And the elders, the church of God throughout history, falls down to worship. Now, if you are struggling to comprehend the chaos and confusion in the world today, isn't this just the most incredible image to give you hope for the future? And if you're struggling with issues in your own life and wondering whether God is even there, let alone in control, isn't this an image to revive your flagging spirits? In this one chapter, we are confronted by the authority and power of the Father, the incredible sacrifice of the Lamb, crucified, raised and ascended, the authority of Christ to roll out the plan of God for the world, the working out of history through the prophecies of the Messiah, the royal power of Christ, the omniscience of the Holy Spirit of God, the prayers of the people coming to God in heaven, the redemption and mercies of God which cause heaven to burst into song, and the sheer cosmic nature of the redemption of the world. This is a quite incredible portion of scripture, and we are left astounded at the imagery. All we can do in response is to play our part with the elders and fall down and worship God, which is what we should do with every breath we take, every part of our being 
spinning and the whole of our earthly lives. So, is the world spinning out of control? Is there any hope for the future? Well, despite all the chaos and all the turmoil, we have every reason for hope. We have every reason to be confident because the Lamb is worthy to open the scroll. In his hands, in the hands of Jesus, the history of the world is kept. There is much that is ungodly and antichrist. There is much that is born out of the sinful arrogance of human beings. But none of that diminishes the authority of God, because at the end of time, all things will be resolved in him, and his glory and authority and power will be revealed for all to see. Lord, hasten the day. So thank you for your time and thank you for being here with me today. I hope you found this a useful podcast and I look forward to being back with you again very soon. Bye-bye.